Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. I welcome you back to our second of our two-week series of a discussion of the surreal nature of artwork. And before getting into today's program with our guest, I want to thank the staff and all those associated with KSPS TV in Spokane to allow us to come to you from their studio rather than, than our studio at North Idaho College. This, these two programs require a larger studio and the fine, fine quality here. I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate KSPS TV uh, for their 40th year. They're celebrating the 40th year. What an incredibly wonderful PBS station this is. And according to Nielsen ratings, it has one of the highest um, viewing audience per capita of, of the 270 or 280 PBS shows in America or TV stations. We've been on the air 35 years and our relationship with KSPS has been wonderful as it has been with Idaho Public Television. But I particularly want to say uh, happy birthday to the 40th year of KSPS. Uh, they are really great to work with. I uh, welcome to the program Gary Hall, who is a wonderful artist, and he was with us last week. And for our viewers who are here, I'm sure you were very taken by the power of his uh, artwork and his paintings, uh, and he is really talented. He has done a number of uh, art shows throughout the Northwest and has an agent in Canada, and his works uh, are up there also. And our viewers throughout Canada, we know you as well as our viewers here in the Northwest, uh, appreciate art. And um, I failed last week to uh, tell you how you could contact Gary, so I don't forget this week. We're going to start out with that. Gary, some of our viewers, I'm sure, would like to be in touch with you, so would you give them a way to contact you? Sure, www.hallscapes.com. So again, it's www.hallscapes with an S. Dot com, and you have also a phone number? Uh, yeah, 265-4227, area code 208. They can also meet, uh, reach me uh, through the MEMA uh, gallery as well that's representing me. That's in Canada? In Canada. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, because uh, uh, sometimes we fail to let our viewers know how they can get a hold of our guests, and I apologize we knew that last week. I, they might have put it on the screen last week. Uh, we have such a great staff, but I forgot to mention it. <coughs> To start out today's program, uh, before we show your first work, um, again, I don't want to be repetition last week because we have a lot of viewers that we have every week, but uh, a couple of questions that were somewhat different from last week. Um, I indicated near the end of the program that you have a, another job and, and you have a spouse and two children, and that takes very important, valuable time. And, uh, when do you do most of your work? Uh, when do you find time to do it? Yeah, I, I'm, I've always joked I'm, I'm a trainer by day and an artist by night. I was in physical therapy as a strength trainer for a lot of years. And, and uh, so, you know, I, I literally was, it was by night, you know. I would um, come home and try and balance family with that. And, and they're, they're wonderful. They've always been very understanding of all that. So, and most artists, I'm sure, uh, can relate to that and that have those kind of responsibilities. And um, so I would put in, you know, three or four hours sometimes at night, go to bed very late and put it in on the weekends. And, but what usually helps is if I've got a, if I have a deadline or if there's a show coming up, um, that really puts a fire under you and, and you've got responsibilities to meet deadlines. And, and that usually helps me to stay motivated and, and work fast. I've interviewed a lot of writers. Uh, some actually some very great award-winning uh, writers for novels and poems and all. And I've always been fascinated with writers and how they get their idea for a book, for example, and and how they go about uh, <coughs> doing their work. And some writers get up every single day and they're disciplined certain hours. And others uh, have certain days they say no, it's not there. And when it when it hits mm -hmm. them, they spend long, long hours. When you're when you're working on a piece. Is it over a long period of time, or sometimes that you feel that you need to really concentrate uh, over a very short period of time? You know, it's an interesting point. I've, I've spent time talking to some other, um, some pretty highly revered professional artists that um, have, we've spoken about that, and, 
And I've noticed times when I'll look at a particular piece and I'll just kind of just let it go and, and not be so concerned about detail and, and just really let it flow and I've really surprised myself. There's been times I thought maybe a piece would take me a couple of weeks and three days I, most of it's done. Other times a piece I thought it was going to be just a breeze is, is taken me because of maybe the technical aspects of it. It's taken me sometimes a month to finish a piece and drying times in between layers has something to do with that. But uh, Do you also find uh, that you have <coughs> times in which you're more inspired than other times or there's times you need to be actually away from your work and not paint for a few days? I think sometimes the you know writers talk about writer's block. Right. I think that probably the most difficult part of that is if you're just not it's really easy to paint when you're inspired because you're just when you're in a state of enjoying yourself and really time just three hours to me can seem like a half hour literally if I'm in the zone and I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. If I'm really struggling with ideas or I'm, I'm trying to force the inspiration, that's a whole other story. Right? So it's it, like day and night. Yes. And I, and I think that's really true of artists. We're going to show the first piece and this is a piece that you brought into the studio and uh, you can describe this remarkable painting. Here we're getting into uh, again obviously landscape um, but as is typical I I like to walk that fine line between the surreal and realism. And here, this one is called Dragon's Breath. And this actually, even though you don't see a dragon in the piece, obviously, I kind of create the mood that perhaps something in the midst of what you don't see is lying there. It came from an idea, a movie that I, I saw um, on King Arthur. And there's a scene in there where Merlin is conjuring up this this whole scene and and called he called it the dragon's breath anytime the the magic was being used and I kind of played with that idea and where the the whole landscape is being encompassed by this entire fog and create just this mystical feel about it and that's really that was pretty much the main point of that so when you look and see the top of the mountain and and certain the certain areas I guess it's uh, a viewer of the painting, you have to imagine what it may look like under there. Right, just to create some, again, to, some. to force a person to use their imagination and everyone's going to be different, like you said, you know, mm -hmm. I, everyone's going to have a little different take on it and maybe even have something to say about it with me that I didn't think of, but that was the main point of that. Yeah, I just think that is um, really good to have some mystery yeah. in, in some of the work and uh, one, one question I want to ask before we go to the next uh, painting, which will be a slide that we'll show in a few minutes, but one thing that's a real earmark of your work is blue. <laughs> right. My favorite color. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I just, it, blue dominates your work, doesn't it, as far as colors are yeah. concerned. And I don't, it's funny because I, I don't think I necessarily set out to do that. It's just kind of the way it unfolds that way. I just keep gravitating to the intensity of blue and, and you know, I, I think years ago when I, the first few galleries I showed through, uh, uh, the owner said to me, um, your work really reminds me of a, like a Maxfield Parrish blue and at the time, embarrassed as I was, I knew of Maxfield Parrish's work if I saw it, but I wasn't lining it up and I was, right. I, as soon as I l got home I was looking up Maxfield Parish, you know, and, and, I, and I have always been inspired by the use of blues or even siennas to create almost a monochrome feel where you create all of your shading and, and your different aspects and, sh and the texture in different colors, not just mm -hmm. thinking in terms of black and white. You know. and, and with your blue, there's a lot of times clouds and, and the blue and the light white or gray. Right, and you can even, I think it, it creates a really interesting look if you can have a really intense blue sky and then that sky has an influence on the landscape so that in the shadows you're going to be seeing, mm -hmm. and, and you see that in a lot of artists' work, but I, I like to really intensify it. Yes. The next <clears> one is a slide that you brought that we'll show of a painting that you don't have with you, but this is the slide. This is actually a rather large piece. Um, it's a four foot by four foot piece. 
uh, about as big as I ever work if I'm working big. And of course it worked really well for that because when that's hanging on the wall and of course it's primarily a sky scene, mm -hmm. I wanted to create that feel that you were, would be amongst the clouds, that you felt that you were so high up, give you that feel of, that dramatic feeling of spaciousness and almost take your breath away. And so a, a painting like that, that large, should probably be, um, if someone purchased it, would be in a uh, high ceiling uh, entry yeah, or something. You, it, it, not a small room, it needs... Uh, right, you definitely have, the, have to have the wall space for that. To, but you'd be surprised, I'm, I'm surprised at how um, there's times when I'll put up a piece that size and all of a sudden you step back and it doesn't look like it's four feet. It actually looks more like it's maybe two and a half feet. It, it's kind of amazing how a wall will swallow a piece. Yeah, I believe it went to a different slide there that wasn't quite ready, but that's another piece there, isn't it? But no, that's the same one. Okay, uh, oh, they just came in shot, on, right. I see what they did. They came in on a close Right, side. but the, the other aspect of that particular piece, I, I did a whole series of pieces called Observer in Blue, and um, I've always been fascinated. Uh, obviously, I've already talked about my interest in science, but in mm -hmm. astronomy. And but look blue. at the difference in color. You know, one minute ago has much lighter blue. This has got a lot of really dark blue and then some light blue. So right, different different grades of the same mm -hmm. blue, and right. and uh, kind of mix it up a little bit. Then I'm going to ask them to put up the next uh, painting we have here in the studio. To, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing a combination of paintings that he actually brought into the studio, and others are slides. And here's one from the studio that we have. Uh, here that, uh, again, here you are climbing up the great mountains and to the top there is something happening there. There's a, Same I keep ca talking about a destination where you arrive. Yeah, again, this is from that same series. This is one of the Observer in Blue pieces and, and again, this is a piece where I'm creating uh, a little, an image where you would just be, um, kind of really give you this incredible spacious feel that you're on top of the world at the same time make it interesting enough mm -hmm. with the structure that you can kind of really would love to put yourself there. Mm -hmm. I, I, all your work, and I, I've seen most of it, I think, over the years, you, um, you don't do paintings where, I, I guess for lack of a better term, where it's very closed in. You're, you're, there are spacious, there is expansion. Right. That people can move to different levels. And, mm -hmm. and, and of course, that, that goes back to um, what inspires an individual themselves, right. and, and usually the artwork is going to reflect their own inspirations. And so I've always been, I mean, there's nothing more incredible to me than to be even flying in a plane and going through a cloud formation and just that awesome feeling. And to create that in a, in a piece of artwork is... You know, this, after all the years I've known you, this is the first time that that's really come real, real clear to me. I, you are a very objective person. You are very curious. You are very inquiring. and uh, you're. You're not static, and so I see. Mm -hmm. I see that for. The, I now understand how that's in your paintings. You're very much a critical thinker, and you, you're not afraid of ideas. And, and no, and I really, I like I've said before. I, I've really this last year. Well, it's for the last ten years my studies, but it's really been this last year that I've really gotten into playing with the idea of if I'm an observer, as proven in physics, that the observer is affecting particle mass, your environment then why not a piece of artwork? Mm -hmm. if, if my intent, the whole time I'm focused on prosperity, for example, that, according to physics, should have an effect on the viewer, sure. consciously or unconsciously. But in a, you know, just to come up with ways to have a positive impact and to use the artwork more than, well, this matches my couch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I want something that I can contribute a little deeper than that. Yes. And, and not that there's anything wrong with that. I do that. I find things but, that but that's more match the house. And but that's more limiting. Uh, yeah. In the process. Can, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to another slide now you, that you've brought here. Landscape, same series. This is coming from uh, Observer in Blue. And I'm just, again, mixing up. And we talked about how, you know, where do you come up with the ideas? And this is an example of that. This is an example of how one piece came from... This one came from one of the pieces we just shown. The original four-foot piece, the, uh, the mm -hmm. first Observer in Blue. And again, I've got the observatory in there, which is symbolic of the whole sky. But when you look scene. at that, on the left there that was in the other painting, but you're moving to another... You've, you've brought into the painting then uh, another mountain mm -hmm. with uh, 
the trees on top, that is, but still at, the, right. at the end of that, there is something there right. at the height. Right, and again, you know, this is, this is a piece that I couldn't exactly tell you um, why I did everything, but this is one of the pieces I did that just, I painted as it was, as it was coming to me. Uh -huh. And I've had people come up to me and say, it's really interesting that you've got two mountains and mm -hmm. separate from each other, and why is that? And I think it's kind of fun to let people figure that out for themselves sometimes. It's an extension of the other one, I think. Uh, we'll go to the next one, which is a painting that you brought here in the studio. This is a more recent piece. Um, and by the way, most of these pieces are oil. I, um, I used to work primarily in acrylic. I still do a little bit, but, but you've these gone mostly are, to oil. I've gone, yeah, and the reason is, is I, I can layer and work translucently. If you think in terms of the difference between surface color and stained glass, the intensity is really quite different. One really is approached from a science perspective, I think, that you really have to understand color theory. You really have to understand how to layer pure color on top of each other to create alterations of color. And what happens is that the light travels through, and, and there are areas that I paint opaquely, but in the areas where it's translucent, that light is traveling all the way through those layers of paint, bounces off the white of the background, and when it comes back to the eye, you see a more intense, clean color. And that can only happen if you do oil painting for that particular well, purpose. Well, no, artists can have been able to do that in other mediums, but I find that oil is the purest form or the purest medium to achieve that, the cleanest. Um, it's a little, it can be um, a little more difficult because of the drying times. Okay. But these days with mediums and hardeners, you can speed that process up. But, you know, if you think of the difference between a painted wall that might be really bright and stained glass and light traveling through that stained glass, you can see the difference of translucency as opposed to just surface color. But since you're convinced that it's a more pure process, then that's what you use. Mm -hmm. That's why you, your right. favorite. It, it, right, and, I, and because I'm obviously, I'm a lover of more of a surreal color, I'm gonna gravitate sure. in the direction that allows me the greatest extent of that, that richness of color. Sure. We'll take your third slide on this program that you brought with your... This was the last of that series uh, in Observer in Blue, and of course, this one here, I, I kind of had fun with um, using only blue. Of course, up in the upper left on the mountain, I went into some siennas, and I kind of, just to create a little diversity in there so it wouldn't flatten it out too much, but this one was just having fun with really challenging myself in creating different variations of depth using only one to two different blues. There's a lot of dominance in your paintings of, of course, skies and mountains and lakes or water. Mm -hmm. Those are real. Another thing that I wanted to ask you about this one, and it's an, I've seen it's been, is the moon is a very important <coughs> uh, characteristic in your paintings, isn't it? Yeah, I think that one, my personal, just my own personal taste, my favorite time of day is that twilight, okay. especially in summer when you can really enjoy those later portions and you're getting those really rich colors of that setting sun and then those times when during a twilight, there's, there are actually times when it's still really daylight but that's, that moon, especially a crescent, is just you can almost see the craters and it creates some drama, I think. It, there might be another to reason, too. Scene. That's when you get to do your painting. <laughs> right. So that might be a favorite time of the day because right. you do your, your paintings at night right, yeah. when you're away from your other occupation, when you're right. being the most creative sure. of all. Uh, next one is from the studio, a painting that you brought with you today. And yeah, this is, we're getting back to the abstract yeah. um, again. And, and of course, it's abstract where it's a, a mix of uh, sky scenes again and a little bit of, uh, I wanted to show in this piece, this one involved more symbology, and the eye uh, was representative of that observer mm -hmm. within all of us. Uh, this is really, this really bridges for me science and a little bit of mysticism in, in, in that there's a duality to all of us, that there's a greater aspect to all of us, and that uh, by shifting those those aspects of mind, 
we're able to perhaps tap a deeper aspect of ourselves. So the eye was kind of a, that observer, that really that quiet observer in all of us. And then the sun and the moon um, being symbols of that duality. It gives one a lot of food for thought and, right. and contemplate. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, one of the problems in the modern world in which we live is that um, people don't have much quiet time anymore. No. Young people are at the top of the list, you know, they, you know, they're going to school, and of course then they're going to hear rock bands, and now they have these little white things in their ears all day, and right. they're listening to music. So it's hard to find time for quietness, and, and I think it's out of that. That's too bad. That, that's too bad because you're suggesting that's very helpful. Right. Our f next one, our fourth one, is a slide of, of the slides, and so, oh, what a gorgeous really one. Really a different, um, yes, different. I, I found that I'm, I am working down different avenues all at the same time, and especially in working with oils, you have so much downtime for, for drying that I, um, I found that it's, it's a little more productive for me to work on perhaps two, three, or four different subject matters at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of found it recently kind of fun to uh, dive into um, uh, vineyards. I personally love uh, collecting red wines and uh, and I've done a lot of research and study into the science of all of that and the health benefits of it. And so anyway, I, I thought, well, I might as well merge some of my interest in that with some of my artwork. And That's so I've, really I've kind of taken some surreal qualities and changed the format where I'm working in warmer colors. In fact, there's some research, particularly from the French, that uh, not, not to be excessive and become mm -hmm. an alcoholic, but mm -hmm. uh, that red wine is often thought to be able to uh, help keep uh, the arteries from clotting and all the it's a, a clean, cleansing process yeah. if you if you right. manage it and you don't over consume. Right, it is really interesting the history to it. It really is a, an amazing alchemical process that mm -hmm. happens mm -hmm. in the production of red wine and mm -hmm. and uh, the health benefits and it's really something else. Yeah, that is that is really interesting. I believe that we have, I think one more that we're going to show. That will be the last painting. And I, Gary, I thank you so much for bringing so many in, uh, both in here in the studio and some slides with you. So it's given our viewers a real taste of what is going on. But before we do that, we're getting somewhat short on time. And I'm here is the painting, and then we'll talk about something else. But here's another one, another vineyard, right? Yep. This was actually the uh, first one, I believe, in the series that I've been working on. Um, and uh, I, this is kind of has some Spanish uh, qualities to it, Italian. I kind of mix it all into one. I don't necessarily take a landscape and just mimic one particular area. I kind of like the idea that I can, I can just let my imagination create uh, the landscape a little differently. What's interesting about these now that there's, there's more colors. <laughs> You're right. getting more green and mm -hmm. browns and warmer all colors. In. Warmer colors. Which yeah. are great compliments, of course. Blue and orange oh, yeah. are, are yeah. wonderful compliments. Yes. Our viewers will not be able to see it today, but I bought from you uh, the most unusual piece that you've ever done. And it's, we call, I call it a political piece. And it, it's just completely uh, different. And uh, someone who followed your works would not know you did this one. Right. But it has to do with World War II and honoring democracy and its victory over Nazism. And uh, how did you, uh, and I won't try to describe it all, but it, you know, there's a skeleton of a man with a World War II hat on and, and the Statue of Liberty in both eyes, and behind him is a Nazi flag with the American flag burned over mm -hmm. top of it. It's mm -hmm. really a powerful message to say that uh, there's a great price you pay for liberty. How did you come up with that when it's so out of context right. of what you usually do? Well, and, and that particular piece, of course, was at a time when I was really developing, and so I hadn't, I was really experimenting with a lot of different areas, and that particular piece, the political piece, was, uh, we were, when it was when I was in college, actually, and, and the professor told us that we needed to okay. come up with an idea that would exemplify the struggles we have these days with hate. Yeah. Um, and the neo-Nazi situation back then, and and how would we, if we were an artist uh, okay. that could paint something on the cover of Newsweek, for example, how would we depict that? And I tried to show it as um, a threat to what we love. And the pro and uh, with the it shows the death of a, a, I believe, American soldier, 
Uh, and the Statues of Liberty says it all. Right, but, right. But I think that was a really powerful message. Mm -hmm. uh, up on the screens come your contact information, and uh, you might verbalize that to those who are not watching, but in another room and can hear it. It's uh, www.hallscapes.com. Uh, numbers area code 208 265 4227 or memagallery.com. Uh, which is in Canada. Yes. Uh, so your works are. I assume on your website you can you have illustrations of your works that they can see. And yes, um, and even if they go to MEMA, um, they can uh, click on on me. There's several artists that they represent, and uh, they've done a wonderful job of displaying uh, the work. Your works, but other works too. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I assume you have on the drawing board now some others that you um, you said on the other show that you had on the back burner. Yes, on the back row, but you said in another show you have enough sketches to last you for 20 years, but I assume you'll be doing other sketches even. Some of those may never get done. Exactly. That's what, exactly what happens uh, because it's, people say, well, what's your favorite piece? I say, well, whatever piece I'm currently working on, that's my, that's my favorite piece. Yeah. It's always been that way. Same with the sketches. There's a man by the name of uh, Harold Laswell <laughs> who talked about values, and he said, um, that there were eight values he thought in the world, and one of them was skill. And I think of artists and, and, and people in the humanities when you deal with the skill. And so uh, I know one time I saw a painting of yours, and you weren't going to let it be shown. You're going to throw it away, and I couldn't see what the problem was. But that's a good illustration of how per right. perfection is for all you people. Gary, on that note, I have to bring the permanent conclusion. And this two weeks has been a pleasure to be with you, thank and you so thank much. you for showing all your work. It's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you be with us again next week. Uh, at the same time, we'll move to yet another issue. And I also want to thank KSPS again for allowing us to use their studio for these two weeks, and congratulate them one more time on their 40th anniversary, which is a very special milestone in their great productions. Until next week, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.